everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show here and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 29. And before we get started, I'm going to make just a few uh, quick announcements here. The very first one is that I'm holding my Click 3D photogrammetry class next week. And so if you are interested, Oops, there we go. I hope everybody can still hear me. <laughs> I totally hit the wrong button there. Um, what I wanted to do was just, uh, let me, give me a second here. I totally messed that up. Uh, let me get back in there and share my screen. Okay, there we go. You should hit refresh on the right keyboard, not on the wrong keyboard. All right, so that what it was about. It was Click 3D Photogrammetry, it's next week. If you're interested in photogrammetry and learning about how you can use a digital camera to make 3D models, uh, just head over there and uh, you'll find some more information. So it's ai2-3d.com. Also, uh, coming up June 21st to 24th is the Canadian Society of Forensic Science Conference. And so I'm one of the organizers for this particular conference. And so if you are interested in forensics, we got a great lineup of speakers already, uh, some which will be announced shortly. We were sort of uh, preparing things and uh, the website is up though. So if you want to look for uh, submitting an abstract, if you want to register, and even if you're a sponsor and you're interested in sponsoring, um, you can head over there and uh, and do your thing there. So no problem. All right, great. Let me uh, turn that off. Let me remove that. And let's get started here. Well, our uh, guest today is Teresa Stotesbury. She's an assistant professor and a researcher in the forensic science program at Ontario Tech University in Canada. And she completed a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Science and PhD in Materials Science at Trent University, also in Canada. And she completed a Master of Science in Forensic Science at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, which was a great experience, I'm sure. Teresa's research group characterizes how biological tissues, like blood, which we're going to be talking about today, degrades in the environment, and she's looking at innovative ways to use this information to help with investigations. Her research group also focuses on developing new uh, biomaterials like forensic blood substitutes, like this little guy over here, and you know, for training and research applications in forensic science. So uh, on that note, I'm going to bring Teresa in. There she is. Hello. Hi, Eugene. Hi, Teresa. How are you today? Good. Thanks so much for having me here. And hi to everyone who's watching and watching later. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, one thing I should say, folks, if you have some questions, uh, there is uh, the comments box there on YouTube. So just drop it in. When you put it in there about 15 seconds later, we'll see it here. So first thing, Teresa, I'd like to start at the beginning before Teresa had a had a an MS uh, master's and a PhD. But when you first started, were you always a person interested in science? Were you uh, thinking of other things beforehand or how and how did you get into this? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I love this question because it, it shows kind of I'm one of those people that fell into the field of forensic science, mostly because I loved every single thing about science and math. Um, so I remember uh, when I was, you know, first starting to figure out what I was going to do with my life. I knew I always liked sciences, but I couldn't figure out which one. I liked the law. I loved the kind of like detective shows. And uh, so I thought, oh, forensic science could be it. So I um, packed my bags and did an undergrad at Trent University. And uh, during my time there, I had this amazing opportunity to do some research uh, with Mike Illis and the Ontario Provincial Police and, and uh, did some work there. And I just got hooked, totally hooked into forensic science and forensic chemistry. And I can tell you more about my journey. Um, just just let me know. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I mean, you, um, you, you obviously went to New Zealand, which must have been a great experience as well. Um, because you work with blood, I mean, a lot of the people there, New Zealand and the people, that, some of the people there are very well respected in the whole bloodstain pattern analysis community. Well, how was your experience there? Oh, it was incredible. So um, as soon as, so during my undergrad, uh, Mike uh, Illis had uh, the opportunity and we had the opportunity to have Michael Taylor come and visit uh, our lab, Dr. Michael Taylor, who has unfortunately passed, um, but his legacy still remains for sure. So I met uh, Michael there and I come from a small little village of Air, Ontario. And he had said, hey, 
why don't you know if you want to continue in this world of blood stains and if this interests you uh why don't you come down to new zealand and i was like what and so, okay sounds good so um i was fortunate enough to um have a, a travel scholarship to go down and begin my master's journey uh in uh, uh the esr institute where michael worked and it was the first time I'd ever actually been on an airplane. So that was quite the trip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> first time uh, leaving North America. So that was exciting. Um, and yeah, and Michael made this amazing research group. And, you know, I still have this amazing group of friends that we so-called dub ourselves the bloody doctors. So shout out to them. And uh, who have worked in the field of bloodstain pattern analysis and, uh, and everything from biomechanics to cognitive bias to automated technologies. And so I'm sure you can think of uh, some of the readers uh, and some of the papers that you've heard coming out of that lab. Um, so working with Michael and also uh, I had the opportunity in part of my PhD to come back and do a bit of uh, research with Dr. Mark Jeremy as well. in uh, just just literally across the street um, down at the University of Canterbury in uh, his lab. And honestly, it was just so eye-opening. I came from a background of chemistry. Really, I took a lot of analytical chemistry. I really got into, you know, the environment and, and analytical chemistry around that. And doing a master's really in figuring out how fit blood stains form and then developing materials that could simulate blood uh, was a whole new experience. And that's uh, kind of a, a neat thing that... I bring into my research group today, while we're primarily housed in chemistry and materials chemistry, we always come back to always thinking about, well, how do blood scenes form at crime scenes and how does this kind of help us understand how, how what we're looking at in terms of the chemistry of a blood stain uh, found at a crime scene? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's what a great opportunity. I, I'm dying to get to New Zealand. I can't wait to get back there. I was there years ago and uh, my, my cousin now lives in Auckland. So I've got an excuse to get back. And uh, of course, I, I, I've met a lot of the people uh, from ESR and from, from uh, you know, the universities down there. So yeah, it's, uh, they're very well known. So shout out to the people in New Zealand. Great job. And I think I know some of the people you're talking about in your little, uh, in your bloody group there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've met some of them or most of them. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so today, uh, you're at Ontario Tech University. What can you tell us about the group that you are with and, uh, the kind of work you're doing? Yeah. So I started a position as an assistant professor at Ontario Tech University back in August of 2019. So you can imagine what it was like starting a research group in a lab in a global pandemic, but that's for a different day. And nonetheless, we are a small, but very mighty research group in forensic chemistry. And so my lab uh, primarily looks at a couple things. We, we look at how blood stains form. We look at how blood stains degrade. And then we try to, to take all of this information that we know. You have to study blood and understand how blood behaves in order to make blood and make fake simulants or artificial fluids, forensic blood substitutes, tomato, tomato, kind of whatever you want to call them. At the time, you know, the, our language is still, um, our terminology is still kind of, uh, here or there, but let's call them forensic blood substitutes for this uh, interview. So our forensic blood substitutes, uh, we make a bunch of different types of polymers and uh, to either simulate spatter, react with um, a common chemical enhancement reagents like luminol, LCV, et cetera. Uh, and also, and the newest thing that my group is really hot to trot on is figuring out um, how to make materials and also un to degrade like blood would. And in order to do that, we have to understand first how blood degrades at a crime scene. And so here's my research group. You can see them. Um, very, very proud of all of them, past undergrad, uh, grad students, uh, current grad students, and they're all doing, they're all up to amazing things. I should mention there's going to be one more person coming in May, Colin Elliott. He's coming too, and he's going to start looking at uh, some DNA degradation and in, in, uh, blood stains. Excellent. Excellent. Um, since we're going to be talking about blood today and the, the chemistry of blood and things and some of the things you mentioned already, let's start with blood. Let's start with what is unique about blood versus other types of fluids like water and, and such. So what, where, what's a good starting point there? Right. So blood is a very, very complex material, right? It's like our aqua vitae of life. So you can imagine that in order to sustain life, 
there has to be lots of components in blood because blood has a lot of functions in the body. Um, so, um, and for us in forensic science, blood also does a bunch of things outside of the body that it wouldn't naturally do inside the body. So blood's composed of um, cellular elements like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. It's, uh, and then it's all suspended in this plasma, which is primarily water, but has um, ions in it, um, some, some biomolecules, maybe some dissolved gases. You can imagine there's a lot of chemical compounds lots of biomolecules and active biomolecules that are in uh, housed in blood. And so um, so at, for forensic scientists, we're really good at a couple things with uh, looking at blood because bl blood has a wealth of information in it, right? It contains DNA and we're awesome at being able to you know collect DNA and generate uh, genetic profiles from blood. Um, the blood same pattern analysis analysis community or the BPA community is really good at saying how the blood got there. So looking at the size, the shape, the distribution of the blood stains in order to interpret what happened and how did that blood source get there? What did the patterns tell about the events of the crime? And uh, for us as chemists, there's about a decade or so, maybe a little bit more of research that is trying to add more questions uh, and uh, applicable questions to what blood can give you at a crime scene. And so we're focused a little bit right now. We we bit the bug on uh, when. So is there ways or that you can use um, any types of the biomolecules, whether they um, you know stay present for a long time or they start changing through their degrading, maybe they're metabolizing, maybe they're actually being generated, some of these compounds as blood stain degrades uh, over time. What are these biomarkers in order can we understand them? Can we understand how they form and they degrade over time? And then can we maybe put a timestamp to that? And so you may have read in the literature, uh, people talk about aging blood stains. So it's not saying, oh, this person was 61 years old or, you know, whatever, 15 years old or whatever, hopefully not. Um, and um, it's about time since deposition. So how long has that blood stain been on a surface for? It can be quite useful in trying to also figure out the events uh, of bloodshed. Right. So, yeah. So you mentioned about some of the chemical properties of blood, and then you talked about you know what blood stain pattern analysts may be doing, for example, when they're looking at the mechanisms or the physical aspects. And blood is also not like water. So there's it's a, what people refer to as non-Newtonian fluid. So what can you tell us about a non-Newtonian fluid? What what is unique about that? Yeah. So blood's a non-Newtonian fluid, and so you know all those cellular elements that I had mentioned, primarily the red blood cells, lots of red blood cells. Uh, in blood. And so um, not in blood is a type of non-Newtonian fluid, meaning that the amount of force and particularly shear that you apply to um, blood, uh, it, its response to it in terms of its viscosity will change over the amount of shear that you'll put on uh, to the blood. In the case of blood, it's a shear thinning fluid. So the more shear that you put on or expose the blood to, its viscosity will decrease in a really non-linear uh, fashion over time. So that's why it's described as a non-Newtonian fluid. What makes it such a, an, an interesting uh, fluid to work with in blood stain pattern analysis and for all the physicists uh, that are deeply involved in the field of blood stain pattern analysis is that viscosity is heavily related to how, how um, blood will uh, spread and make blood stains across surfaces. There's a couple other fluid properties that are linked, you know, to this, like surface tension, density, pack cell volume. They're, you know, they're very all linked. Um, so that makes this uh, this uh, these problems of being able to to model and the spread and the distribution of the blood stains at a crime scene really really complex. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously we talk, we're still going to talk and we're going to get into some of the research that you've done. I want to bring up some of the papers and then ask you some questions about them. Uh, but the fact that, you know, researchers are going to be using blood for making impacts, for training, for whatever different reasons in terms of using animal blood as a substitute, I know you've done some work there, uh, but how, how useful or how similar are some types of animal blood, uh, with respect to human blood? 
Uh, it's a, a great question. Um, and I actually was just talking about this earlier in a, um, in a meeting in uh, defense today. What's, what's a, is a blood substitute, whether it's animal or synthetic or, or uh, not validated or not. And I think we're, we're kind of leaning towards it's, an, it's accepted. So um, uh, I know you've worked with blood before and you know that if blood is, is difficult to work with, if there's no, uh, in its, you know, natural form, right? So we, so you clots, we're built to clot. So um, you have to put things into blood in order to be able to research it. Uh, or, you know, do for training and forensic like BPA courses, 4 ER blood stain courses. So how do we get a how do we get blood and keep it um, viable for the purposes of research and training? And the blood stain community and the forensic community has come up with a bunch of alternatives. Some of them being uh, animal blood sources like uh, bovine blood, uh, porcine blood, so cow, sheep, um, and pig. Sorry, I said them in <laughs> opposite orders. And a lot of this work was really uh, fundamentally laid down uh, by Liz Williams, Ursula Winberger, and uh, Michael Taylor's group. And uh, they were saying, you know, hey, if you can use animal blood, if you put an anticoagulant in it, you know, you'll, you can see similar fluid properties to um, to human blood. And so it's a kind of an accepted substitute there. Uh, here in, in our labs, uh, it's difficult for us to source uh, um, uh, porcine blood sometimes. And, you know, in Canada, we use uh, sheep's blood most of the time, but uh, we wanted to see if other bloods, uh, blood sources would be okay for use in forensics. And so we uh, spent some time looking at bovine blood and uh, seeing how it, it would make stains and or how it would be acceptable as a blood substitute. And we found that similar to the studies that have been previously published, uh, you know, with an anticoagulant in there, uh, you can, you can uh, use blood within a, you know, a couple days of use uh, for, for uh, like spatter simulation or blood, uh, blood stain simulation and, um, and basic, real basic blood stain research. So if you have just regular blood, you just pull blood, you don't have any anticoagulant in it, how much time are we talking? Like if you refrigerate it, if, I mean, we're talking minutes, an yeah, hour? <laughs> minutes, minutes of that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so um, the, the anticoagulants don't show any like major detriment to using animal blood in, in that regard. Uh, I would say no. I think the, the most important bit is uh, that if you are using any type of simulant or even if you're using human blood with an anticoagulant, um, think about what properties you care about that you're researching or you're, you're demonstrating to your class and make sure you know them or if you have, you know, the ability to measure them. So can you, before you use uh, a blood source, can you obtain its viscosity or density or surface tension, plasma protein concentration, things like that. It really just depends on kind of the property that you care about. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And one thing about the blood though, is it's expensive. So, you know, a, a liter of blood, you know, when we get it here, you know, it's checked, so it's pathogen free or whatever. So blood substitute, if we start talking about um, the blood substitute and how you, how, how did you come about working on a blood substitute? Yeah, so a recognized need in the uh, blood stain community is, is what we're kind of talking about now is what's an acceptable blood source? Should we use a standardized blood source? Uh, is animal blood acceptable? Or is anything else that can behave like blood uh, acceptable for use in research uh, and training? And so, um, you know, I embarked on a bit of this journey starting in my master's and looking at, well, what do we care about in, uh, in blood stains in order to make synthetic mat uh, like materials that would behave like blood? And I uh, came up with some criteria for that and then continued on with my uh, PhD uh, and looked at, okay, if, is there any way that, so, so now we know the properties, we know the properties that we care about in the blood. Can we take uh, polymers and make polymers and, and liquid polymers um, do the same thing. And, and there's a, and so what we did was we made uh, synthetic blood, like synthetic substitutes. So these don't have any biological, biological components in them. There's no real um, uh, biohazards, but we said, can we make these little colloids? We call them uh, soul gels there. You can think of them as kind of like, 
um, little little glass colloids that it's are silicone. It's silicone gel, or what? What is uh, it? It's like a silica, a silicar SiO two core, and then they have these little organic groups that kind of make them a a, a little more, I guess, elastic and functional for for, for uh, as a chemist. So we can do some more interesting chemistry uh, on them. Um, and yeah, to to kind of simulate the properties that blood have. What's really nice about this system here in the paper that you uh, popped up is not only did were we able to modify, you know, the concentration of the colloids uh, and other things that we added to it, but they're really inert. So what we were able to do uh, and what future research, uh, particularly Samiko Polacco did, was we said, hey, we can actually put some um, biomolecules in there, like enzymes, and uh, see, you know, hey, it, can it react like blood? Um, so not only, yeah, and the figure that you're showing here is we, we did a bunch of uh, work on looking at the fluid properties uh, of our materials, um, the, LA, the, the GT, what we denoted here as the GT and the LAGT and the FBS compared to uh, other blood substitutes in water. And so, you, so again, we were really modifying our uh, polymers so that they had similar viscosity, density, surface tension uh, values to, to um, human blood. Um, the purposes for this blood substitute was that it, it would kind of make drip stains like blood would. So we spend a lot of time looking at the spread uh, and how uh, drip stains could be formed. Um, right. And, and there's, not you have a lot of, yeah, other patterns. <laughs> You have a paper on that too, I believe, right? You did something where you you actually looked at making uh, uh, drips with the uh, substitute, the blood substitute, and then uh, so what were you comparing then? Uh, yeah, so I mean, in my in uh, we were comparing values to human values and what's seen in the literature and some of the experiments that uh, we had done in the lab. Um, and then, so we were looking at their size, uh, the number of spines and scallops that were formed from it. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, yeah, and basically how uh, how these stains looked in a bunch of conditions. So like how how high were they dripped uh, from the surface? Um, I think we had a student uh, look at impact angles. Um, yeah, just like kind of like what you would would do in a blood stain course. Right, right. So, I mean, this is something you started back when you were at Trent and then you've kind mm -hmm. of, there's been some changes obviously, but, uh, but is, is it still something you're looking at developing? Is it something that people can still get? Is it something that you're going to, you know, up, upgrade to 2.0 or something or, or, or what's the status? Yeah, that's a great question too. I'm still getting these questions. So, um, yeah, so currently, uh, so the one thing, uh, so that, we're definitely working on blood substitutes. It's definitely a, a research um, area of mine that I'm definitely passionate about and uh, our group is working on. Um, so a couple things that we're doing is uh, I have a, P a PhD student, Amanda Orr, and she's looking at uh, um, uh, either encapsulating or binding DNA somehow into into uh, blood substitutes and making kind of biologically similar blood uh, substitutes to human blood. Uh, that's a really exciting project, and she's still busy in the lab working away on that. Um, one thing we uh, noted too in our previous re research was that these soul gel systems are awesome in the way that they you know behave and and spread like blood does. But like I mentioned, they kind of make um, like a glass coating. So you can imagine in, in not it, that maybe not be the best for all types of, say, forensic training uh, or research. So what our lab is doing now is we're exploring a, a bunch of different types of polymer systems and, and kind of polymer bases, um, seeing how biomolecules are stable in them or being are able to be encapsulated in them um, and making kind of 2.0, maybe 3.0 type. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, so it's not to say that uh, we're not in the field anymore. We're just busy in the lab coming up with the new kind of uh, model. Okay. Well, you have to keep us posted there because I, I know that, uh, well, for you know, especially now with things being virtual and that sort of thing and people can't get together, it's not easy for everybody yeah. to get hold of blood. But you know, if it's a blood substitute and it's rather, you know, har you know, harmless or whatever, then people can run their own experiments just about anywhere, right? So um, I can see a lot of benefit uh, with that. Um, let me ask you about 
uh, well, something you've, you've already alluded to, which is, you know, now working from the substitute, looking at real blood and, you know, the kinds of information um, that you can pull from blood to help in an investigation. And so I want to bring up this paper here that's uh, quanti quantifying visible absorbance changes uh, and DNA degradation in aging blood stains and, and under extreme temperatures. Um, mm -hmm. What was the, what was the, uh, like the inspiration for getting into this particular area? Uh, yeah. So, um, again, like, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it's always good to, to understand blood in order to mimic it. Right. So we kind of, our group is, has a pretty good foundation for building, uh, substitutes and being, and showing that they work for say spatter simulation or, or other pattern simulation and uh, chemical reactivity. But the next best thing, and something that I had heard about a bunch of times when I was taking this blood substitute into training uh, was, okay, does it dry like blood? Does it flake like blood? Does it, is there the, you know, the color changes that you would, you would expect to see with blood over time? And so we kind of call that, um, like we call those things that are happening like degradation. And so in order to, again, make a material that that degrades like blood, we need to really understand how blood degrades. And there's a lot, like I mentioned, there's a lot of research in this field in how blood stains degrade. So you can imagine it's a really complicated process and it's all driven by the fact that blood has so many things in it that and everything's changing at different rates so that when it starts to degrade over time, you have you see a, a, a series of complex events happening. So you can imagine a blood stain forms. And then immediately, we're going to start seeing some interesting things. It's going to start coagulating. Um, you're going to start seeing drying in different rates at different areas in the blood stains, most of the time from the outer um, perimeters inwards. Um, so the plat like the water and the plasma, we're going to see desiccation, you're going to see a bunch of volatile organic compounds coming off from the blood. On top of that, most of these blood stains are out in the environment. So you're going to start seeing degradation of some biomolecules, enzymes are going to start degrading key biomolecules, things like uh, DNA will start degrading, well, the cells will start rupturing the, um, the DNA and the RNAs will uh, start acting on the blood stains and they, they all start degrading. <laughs> and yeah. so and the, he the hemoglobin starts changing, it'll start getting oxidized and it'll start coordinating with a, a bunch of different um, molecules like oxygen and histidine. I could go into this forever. Guys. What about what about like, for example, between yeah. people? So for example, yeah. you know, like blood, I mean, is blood um, fairly, uh, fairly consistent between people, or can we see fairly large swings or different, different kinds of properties, uh, to, to a significant degree between somebody that's young, somebody that's old, somebody that's taking, I don't know, different diet, a medication or something like that. Uh, can you notice the differences between people? Yeah. So, uh, those, there are definitely ranges of properties, uh, between uh, people and interestingly enough depending on uh, those properties will also change within you uh, at any point in the day or depending on your diet maybe you had a couple drinks the night before um, you know that will change so it makes it more complicated but I just wanted to swing back a little bit to that sure. DNA uh, or that degradation thing and because yeah. I was sorry I went I went on a tangent no, <laughs> um, that's all right and yeah, so people, so lots of researchers have really begun this um, research in figuring out, okay, so how does a blood stain degrade? And typically, they'll pick one biomolecule or one type of um, piece of equipment, uh, like a spectrometer or something like that, and and figure out, okay, just using this or this one biomolecule, how does it change over time? And they'll develop a model, and they're, and most are pretty good, you know, like. Uh, they're saying, but it's not perfect for forensics. You know, in forensics, we have to have something that's yep. super duper accurate and uh, reproducible. Um, so that research really got sparked from conversations with uh, with um, an expert in genetics and genomics, so Dr. Aaron Schaefer. And uh, we said, hey, can we put our brains together, a chemist and a, and a geneticist and say, can we can we combine our methods and see if we can get better models for for predicting the age of a blood stain? And so that's kind of what we've been doing. We've been finding ways to kind of collaborate and work on the chemical changes and uh, the changes to the DNA and the RNA or 
um, over time. So we look at color changes, we look at, yeah, DNA and RNA changes. And the other thing we uh, have really started working on, and, and this too is also something that's shown in the literature, is that temperature has a huge influence on the rate of these changes. And so we've been playing around with extreme conditions, like, cause you know, Canada gets quite cold and quite hot and other places in the world too. So uh, we're looking at, you know, simulating, um, blood stain degradation in, in a bunch of environmental conditions. We so, find, depending on what you're looking at, um, it, the, like the person or the donor of the blood um, uh, can influence the model or sometimes not. It really just depends on what, what biomolecule you're looking at. What about some of the different methods that are currently or that people have attempted so far? Like what are some of the different ways that people are looking for, you know, it, the age of the blood stain or time since deposition? Yeah, so, so the most practical uh, ways that have uh, been researched is really looking at color changes. You can do this, actually, there was a group that uh, published a paper on uh, using smartphone technology to do it. The, uh, the complicating issue there is you have to have perfect lighting conditions and backgrounds uh, because just some changes in those lighting conditions can uh, influence, um, you know, where, where your estimate sits on the model. Um, yeah, a lot of techniques are really on like how light interacts with the blood stains. So, like hyperspectral imaging has been used. Raman and IR spectroscopy have been used. Um, there's been some mass spec work on metabolites. Uh, lots of imaging work uh, from from kind of a, a chemistry perspective. There's also been a lot of research that's looked at, um, um, you know different types of RNAs and how they're found in blood stains and how long they're found in blood stains for, as well as, uh, you know, um, there's a, an abundance of research too on DNA and how DNA degrades. Uh, yeah, our work is, uh, is trying to combine things. And also, we're also trying new, new methods too. Like, can we uh, use mass spec imaging and surface profilometry? So I have a student uh, named Sophie Castle who's doing some work on that. How can we use electrochemistry? <laughs> can we? Yep, you know, okay. electro I, I was I was just going to ask you: Are you yeah. continuing? Like, are you still doing work in this yeah. area? Yeah. Yes, Mitch Thiessen's doing that work, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's really fun. It's kind of a fun project because we get to dabble in a lot of different uh, instrumental techniques, and uh, Ontario Tech has has access to like phenomenal equipment. So I'm really. Uh, our group is just like, whoa, look at this, these toolboxes that we can go play in. <laughs> right, right. Um, what can you tell me about some of the testing that you've done with uh, Luminol? Because uh, you did, I believe you did a, a paper on the, uh, the substitute with Luminol. Um, is there anything else that I was just thinking where you're going to make the blood substitute? Uh, for example, could you, could you include, incorporate other things like DNA uh, material inside of the substitute where somebody can use it more for, you know, a biological analysis or practice with it in that regard. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's something that we're doing uh, currently to uh, Amanda and, and uh, work with uh, uh, Paul Wilson and, and Mike Ellis and myself. Uh, we're all we're all trying to figure out, you know, what are other things that we can put in there. Um, uh, I'm really interested, too, in the incorporation of amino acids into uh, the blood substitute. Um, because that can open up uh, its ability to to be reactive with a with a bunch more blood stain enhancement uh, chemicals. Uh, that paper that you're talking about with the the luminol um, in that work, we put an enzyme called horseradish peroxidase in because again, we were trying to make um, like a totally synthetic uh, material, and we took uh, some horseradish peroxidase in, and we were able to find um, that if you can can make it happy and sit it in this colloidal network it will and and depending upon like the concentration of the colloids and how that that horseradish peroxidase kind of sits in there um it can it can react with aluminol in a similar way to to blood wood really? and you know that there's a bunch of false positive reagents that will react with luminol, like the classic, you know, bleach or copper pennies, or sometimes dust. If you spray at a crime scene, you'll see a big you know, kind of a flicker and, you know, mm, it makes you think, yes, luminol is a presumptive test, uh, but, you know, maybe that's not blood. It could be something else. 
Um, but blood, when blood reacts with luminol, you see like kind of a delayed, um, well, you see emission, but it's the, the luminol reaction or that chemiluminescence happens for much longer over time than certain other compounds. So that work was quite interesting because we really had to manipulate our material in a way that it to make it behave like blood and so that was a pretty fun project so i got a i was i read horseradish horseradish and i was like what are they pulling from this what is it what is yeah. uh, horseradish peroxidase is just a, a component or chemical of of the it's a yeah, it's an of enzyme it? found in a horseradish yeah it's got Jeez. it's just, um structure is has similar chemical structural components similar to hemoglobin so it's not hemoglobin but there's there's some components that are that are uh, that uh, are similar that are help that with our reaction. Wow, who would have known? I wouldn't have known. <laughs> who would have known? <laughs> right, right, right. Hey, what can you tell us about? Uh, you've done some other work uh, with blood stains, but uh, also related to latent prints. Right. Can you talk about some of that or no? Yeah, I can, I can maybe put a little bite to future talks. Please. Uh, but um, let's just say we've, uh, this was a project that came to our lab through Martin Eversdijk in the Netherlands. And um, he was like, oh, Teresa, we found this way that we can remove uh, blood stains from a surface while maintaining the integrity of a fingerprint. I was like, what? No way. What are you doing? So uh, we kind of helped that project, our group, by um, doing some mass spec imaging. And this is a project with Chris Inye and Naomi Stock and Wesley Burr. Um, and basically we showed that, yes, yeah, so, so imagine, let me reverse a bit. Imagine you have like a piece of evidence, right? And there's a fingerprint gets deposited first. And then on top of that, there's a blood stain. Typically you'd collect the evidence. Maybe you'd swab, you'd see the blood and you go, okay, we'll swab it and we'll look for DNA. But maybe, you know, can we find any other information? And so is there a way that you, once you've done your inter your analysis on the blood, is there anything else you can gather from that, that evidence? And uh, Martin showed us a way to remove the blood from the surface while maintaining the integrity of the, the underlying fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And so our question as a re our research group was, okay, are we just seeing the fingerprint residues? Is there any, is there any residual um, molecules that you would find in blood, but not fingerprints? Uh, is there any interaction there? Um, the reason why we were interested in understanding that is because we were saying, well, if we know this information as chemists, then we can say, okay, we can, then you can um, apply these chemical enhancement reagents, you know, to the surface in order to visualize that fingerprint. Right. And so, yeah, that was a really fun project. We did some mass spec imaging. We found that, the, the well, I'll tell you more later, but we, oh, we yeah. did find that we were able to um, uh, see fingerprints and uh, the residues, all the, the, the sebaceous and the eccrine secretion type residues were, were found um, within the, the prints that were okay. what we call recovered from that uh, evidence. Yeah, I saw I saw Martin at a conference, and you know he's usually a he's he's an excitable guy when it comes to his work, and that was probably the most excited I saw him when he was like, "Hey, I got to show you what I got here. This, but we can get we can get fingerprints under blood stains." And he, oh, he was, it was amazing! Yeah. And yeah. They went uh, that uh, group did lots and lots of replicates, so I think um, you know he's pretty confident in in that method. Are you uh, are you working with different people? You can like are there different people in the uh, in, in BPA or maybe in some other uh, disciplines that you're currently partnering with or or working with regularly that you find uh, you know is, is is beneficial? Yeah, our group. Um, so our group is open to any collaboration, um, and so we're working you know between academics and labs. Uh, we're also working with a couple of forensic organizations. It depends really on the project. Um, but our group is into it. So we've done some work uh, looking at how blood stains form outside in extreme, extreme <laughs> conditions like snow and ice. Uh, we're, you know, embarking on some new research looking at uh, chemical enhancement reagents of blood stains, uh, unlatent blood stains in a variety of different, again, environmental conditions. You know, a real, a real question, right, in forensics is like, okay, we understand the basic mechanism, but like, how is this going to work when it's really hot? How is this going to work when it's really humid or really cold? Or there's, you know, this blood stain's been out 
in the environment for so long and, and exposed to sunlight, right? And so a lot of our research uh, comes comes uh, in, into play there. That's when we do a lot of like practical collaborations with, um, you know, Toronto Police is this one right. that you're looking up here was uh, a project that we did uh, with uh, Toronto Police and uh, with Irv and Leslie and Phil, and had we had an awesome time um, looking at how blood stains form in snow, and we didn't, you know, in in kind of pristine snow conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what did you learn from this? I mean, what 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 did you see in terms of some of the differences, uh, you know, of of making drops on ice and snow? Yeah. So, oh, and Amanda and. Um, and Jesse, uh, Amanda Orr and Jesse Plant were involved in this. They were project. there too. Okay, great. And uh, so we found, like you know, um, you know, there's a lot of work on uh, blood stains and textiles, right? And it's kind of like you see these stains, and, you're, and it's really difficult to say, mm -hmm. "Whoa, what happened here?" Because a lot of you know complex phenomena that's happening. Well, similar to that work with the textiles, we see um, we saw similar things with snow. So a lot of you see a lot of real irregular uh, stains. Uh, they, e even though we were creating them kind of 90 degrees to the surface, they didn't always look like circles. And in most cases, they didn't. Um, uh, there were there were differences in in stain size. So we didn't always see that increasing trend with in terms of its diameter with. Right. Uh, dripping height and yeah so uh whew, weird weird stains on snow and ice satellites do form on some surfaces uh that was an interesting find we found too did you find anything in terms of because i'm noticing some of the pictures here like some look more shady then there's like a little bit more sun and so i'm not sure if uh like if you saw if, if you could notice anything with differences in temperature or that sort of thing but um it was yeah was there anything with respect to snow versus ice that was different or anything just caught your attention off the bat yeah definitely this the stains did look different depending on uh yeah so what you're looking at too is uh we had like powdered snow um yeah. terrain type conditions and and uh ice surfaces and the stains all look different there um I would, we have better uh, um snapshots in the actual paper um we had to because we didn't want to in these high speed video um that we collected we didn't really want to touch the snow in any way because we knew like what had happened we had looked check the weather and whatever so we had to have the camera quite high so that we had a real a lot a, like a large range to work with and create some replicates and see if you know how reproducible these stains were <laughs> um Spoiler alert, they're really, really um, not not all that consistent in kind of size and shape. <laughs> uh, but I would encourage you to check out that paper in uh, the Canadian Journal of Forensic Science, and you can see some real, like, snapshots of uh, what the blood stains look like. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great, great, uh, great information. Um, and of course, you know, I, maybe it's one of these things where, well, just like in fabrics, you know, most of what they teach you is to be for, right? It's careful what you say, right, about, uh, about fabric. Same, same kind of thing. And are you doing anything else on, on this? Like, is this progressing at all? Are you looking now to, is, or is Toronto police, are they going to be helping you out with some more work in this area? Oh, uh, yeah. We're, I mean, we're open to anything. We're still, uh, I mean, there's so many questions about how do blood stains form in sub-zero conditions that I don't see this research slowing down at any time. Um, I had a, a um, uh, we've done some other work too on looking at how blood does blood freeze at a given temperature also like what's going on when blood uh, goes bright bright orange at crime scenes so we're uh, you know when you're seeing them outside um and so yeah we're doing some work on that too oh that's awesome <laughs> i like to i like to dabble as you can kind of see yeah yeah you're you're in multiple areas but that's okay the, you know variety right spice of life that's what they say so it keeps it keeps it interesting um, so what, what kind of things, uh, and you already mentioned some things you're currently working on, but what about in the future? Like, are there any other areas that you would really like to pursue that, you know, maybe right now you're not ready to jump into, but you, you, you're imagining in your mind that, Hey, this would be really cool if I, you know, could get in this, into this particular area. I don't even know where to begin. There's so many <laughs> questions I have, but, uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, as we progress, it would be, uh, interesting to maybe expand, uh, our, our, my group's expertise beyond say just blood. 
Uh, maybe we want to look at other types of evidence and see how useful some of our methods are for, say, aging a type of evidence or looking at the surface profile of a, a type of evidence, for example, um, uh, onto other types of, of forensics evidence. So honestly, like, uh, if it has anything to do with chemistry, <laughs> forensics, materials, blood stains, whatever, I'm there. So, oh, good. Um, yeah, wherever the wind and, blows. <laughs> and you're pretty well set up, you said, in terms of uh, in terms of equipment that like at Ontario Tech, you've got a, a pretty good uh, lab or access to, to fairly good equipment. Is there anything else that maybe you don't have that you'd like to get in the future or? Do you want my wish list? Like <laughs> <laughs> when you have to submit budgets at the university yeah. and they go, here's Teresa's list, right? Yeah. Kabong. Kabong. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, um, obviously like, you know, technology is always changing as you know, for sure. So, um, but, but I mean, the, the equipment that we have at Ontario Tech is great. Obviously we're always looking for more and the next best thing because it helps put, keeps continuing with research being on cutting edge. So uh, yeah, I'm really happy. I have a, I have a little lab now. So, uh, you know, if anyone's in the area, obviously post COVID, uh, feel free to, to stop in and say hi and I'll give you the tour. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually. Has, has COVID had any impact on the, the, the speed at which you guys can do things or, or has it been fairly consistent for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's been, it's been uh, definitely challenging. Like everyone else in the world has had to deal with this. So uh, I definitely am not going to complain and say, you know, I had such a brutal, brutal time. But there's definitely have been impacts. Uh, our lab was closed for a bit. It was, it's, it's uh, interesting starting a lab in a pandemic, like I mentioned. Um, but, you know, we, we're just putting our best foot forward and uh, working as a group and going in when we can, uh, making sure that, you know, we're following the health and safety protocols and uh, doing our work. <laughs> If anyone wants to get a hold of you, Teresa, I'm, I'm actually just dropping in the links into the chat window. So uh, to uh, TeresaStotesbury.ca and also to the other one that goes to Trent. But uh, is, can they get get a hold of you through the university, no? Uh, yeah, yeah. You should be able to get a hold of me through uh, yeah, either my website or uh, my university address. Are you, are you speaking anywhere in the near future in terms of uh, conferences and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, def I definitely am. I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking at the Canadian Society of Forensic Science Conference. Mm -hmm. that, will be, uh, <laughs> that will be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and other than that, uh, I'm not sure what the summer brings, uh, but, you know, if there are opportunities, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Excellent. Well, look, we're, we're getting on in time. Uh, I think we covered a, a ton of stuff here. And uh yeah, thanks so much for uh, you know for for coming in here and just talking about some of the work you do. You're working on some really cool stuff. It's great to see that uh, you're you know you're getting supported. You got a great team, and um, you know I uh, again chemistry is not my thing, but you know I you know I I really uh, this this forced me actually to read some of the papers on chemistry, right? Which I, I hated in school, but uh, dark but side. you know what? But they were they there there's some good work there for sure, and uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to working with you too in the future. Yeah, I, totally. Also, yes, we definitely are, we'll, should work together. <laughs> right on. Okay. Um, well, look, we're going to leave it at that. Um, hang back for a bit. I'm going to come back to you and just chat with you. I'm just going to make some closing comments. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Well, that does it for this particular episode. And uh, just uh, before we go, uh, next week, uh, the 20th and 21st, don't forget that I do have the uh, the course again. So if you're interested, just go ahead and go to my website. That's the uh, www.ai2-3d. And also for next week, if you're interested in artificial intelligence, uh, a lot of us have been hearing about artificial intelligence and forensics. And when you do some research in that area, you'll find that you'll learn a lot about uh, digital forensics, so things like cell phones and computer stuff. But my guest next week is Etienne Pilin, and he's going to be talking to us about how artificial intelligence can help us in other areas, like in forensic anthropology, like in bloodstain pattern analysis, in, in firearms, and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, if you are interested, uh, make sure that you're there next week. So everyone, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, everyone being here today, and we'll see you next Thursday, 2 p.m. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.